Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Surprise Jeb Podcast. I'm your host, Zachary Ruger, surprising you with new topics, new information every single episode, every single week, and jabbing you, as always, with your daily dose of UFC information. We talk about all sorts of sports here on the Surprise Jeb Podcast, and it's always good. Just wrapped up uh, classes for the week. I only go to classes on uh, Tuesdays and Thursdays, if no one knows that. And honestly... It was a pretty good day. Um, I'm gearing up for this huge management presentation next Tuesday, November 7th, I believe it is. And I've got some big things planned for that. I recently, um, just in the mail today, got a Hasbulla cutout. And I'm going to center the presentation around Hasbulla. It's the, the chapter that we have to present on is called Technology and Management. But I'm thinking if we bring in Hasbulla, it'll uh, bring some humor to the class. But we're not here to talk about that, even though you might catch Hasbulla on the Instagram post. We're here to talk about all sorts of things today. The big one, UFC Sao Paulo. That's right. The UFC is back in Brazil. A huge ma- huge fight night this weekend. I was going to say a huge matchup, but I mean... The main event is Halton Almeida versus Derek Lewis. It was supposed to be Halton Almeida versus Curtis Blades, but Curtis Blades had to pull out, sadly. So Halton Almeida will not get a shot at a top five heavyweight. But nonetheless, we are loaded with so many good fights. We'll be breaking down all 13 of them, hopefully, before the uh, weigh-ins go down tomorrow. Because sometimes when the weigh-ins go down, fighters don't aren't able to make it and fights get canceled. So that's why we always have this podcast to look back on and see uh, who I predicted would win and lose. Oh, it's going to be talking about week nine of the NFL, giving my predictions as always. We were coming off of a red hot 14 out of 16 correct um, last week for week eight. I actually won my school's pick them. Minnesota State Mankato uh, University, there's like a pick them through like the athletics department. And I won this week out of like hundreds of students, which is pretty dope. And I got a t-shirt that says I'm an intramural champion. So that's always cool. Talking about some new uh, UFC news, new world news, new sports news, some new trailers and stuff. And we're going to be talking about the show Invincible. I binge watched the entire season yesterday. So we're going to be giving a season one recap before season two debuts tomorrow, actually. So Gear up, listen in, and hopefully you are surprised, and hopefully my jabs don't sting too much. You know, honestly, I wonder if I throw a hard jab. I probably don't. I'd probably throw harder straight, and I don't actually know how to... I, I mean, I know how to punch, but I don't know how to like actually like box like well. So, I mean, I wonder if I'd hurt myself throwing like one punch. I always, I always think about that. I've never really been in a fight since maybe like elementary school, but I mean, we'll see. Uh, it, it, I don't know why I'm saying we'll see. We'll see if I get in a fight. Who knows? I, I kind of want to start training MMA because I find I watch so much MMA. I watch UFC all the time. The PFL, I mean, one. I watch the boxing like Nganu and Fury. I'm, I'm all about them combat sports, but I don't do it. So maybe that's something I should try out. I know, I know a couple of my buddies are starting to do it. One's doing jujitsu. One's doing um, uh, Muay Thai. So maybe something I could get into. In the world, um, some world news to hit you with. Uh, Disney is actually buying Hulu. So Disney continues to try and monopolize all the streaming services. I know they got ESPN. I know that they've... Um, what else have, What else has Disney gotten? They're, um, I don't, Netflix they haven't gotten to yet. It was, um, it was a bundle. It was Disney... Or actually, they owned Hulu before, didn't they? Wasn't it Disney, ESPN, and Hulu? So maybe this is just like they're fully purchasing them and maybe gaining all their stuff. Like, I don't know if Hulu's going away, but I saw that. They're acquiring it for like $8.6 billion. Good deal, if you ask me. There's a couple of good shows on Hulu, but nothing nothing that really keeps drawing me back in. I'm more of a uh, HBO Max or just Max, as it's called now, since I get that through AT&T, which is a cool provider. AT&T, I'd sponsor you. You know, I have you for uh, my family's plan for phones and stuff. Plus, I just, I like AT&T. AT&T overall, I get to watch The Sopranos on there, all the Lord of the Rings movies. I mean, they got all sorts of stuff on there, but um, yeah, there's that. Also, in UFC land, Paul Felder is re-entering the um, USADA, not USADA anymore, but the testing pool. Um, Paul Felder, if no one knows, former top 10 uh, lightweight. He was a very talented fighter. Last fought in uh, 2020, stepped in on short notice against Rafael Dos Anjos, who's currently ranked 10. But um, after that, before that, he had had a, um amazing fight against Dan Hooker in Auckland, New Zealand in 2020. But following the Huffle Dos Anjos event, he retired, wanted to be with his family. But the love of fighting, it just, you, you can't get past it. I mean, it, he wants to come back. 
And this is actually crazy. Since um, he suffered three losses since 2018, and all of them have been split decisions, uh, very close fights. And he also has some crazy uh, crazy finishes. I know he has a crazy uh, el elbow finish of Alessandro Ricci. Um, who else is there? There's one more. Uh, Danny Castillo. I mean, this guy's uh, very, he's very talented. I wonder who they'll give him when he debuts. Maybe at UFC 300, Paul Felder will return. That could be uh, pretty, pretty cool. But yes, Paul Felder back in the UFC. I'd... So what's his most notable win? I'd say he has huge wins over Edson Barbosa. Edson Barbosa currently the number 11 uh, featherweight in the UFC. Big win there. He actually also holds a win over Charles Oliveira. I mean, Charles Oliveira, a former lightweight champion, the number one contender at lightweight at the moment. Very talented. And uh, anyone else? Uh, Stevie Ray, uh, James Vick, just some notable fighters that fought in the UFC. But yes, Paul Felder will be back, and I will be very excited to watch him fight whenever that is. April, May... Whenever that goes down. Um, also, UFC Shanghai is official. There, It's official. The UFC is returning to Shanghai. I was wondering if the card was going to get canceled December 9th. Obviously, this fight night will be going down. As there really isn't that many fights. I mean, they just announced... Um, a bunch of big ones. The, so the UFC does this thing called Road to UFC where they kind of go into Asia. Sometimes they go into like Europe and stuff. And they find these up-and-coming talents, um, usually just young prospects, undefeated, and they have um, just a tournament of sorts, a little mini tournament, and the winners of them all make it to um, a fight night, such as the one that we're getting December 9th. And if they win, they get a fight in the UFC. Which is pretty incredible. So I love to uh, I love to see that um, some of the fights that they announce. I'm just I'm kind of doing this to uh, just read you the names because I freaking love them. We have Lee Kai Wen versus Yi Zaha. Lee, the underdog Kai Wen, is 12 and five. Um, he trains at K1 Club MMA, and uh, Yi Zaha. Um, both of these men are from China, of course, which fits why the fight's going down in China. He's 24-4 and four and actually has fought in the UFC before. He did lose, but he is back with a vengeance. Another one, we have a flyweight fight between Ri Tusarura, who's from Japan, and I freaking love this. Little King Kong, Janishu Yu, who's from China. He's, uh, his ex's birthday is on December 9th. Wow. So he turns 23 on the uh, day of the event. So we are rooting for Little King Kong. Um, the other two, we have Zhao Long versus Chang Ho Li. Bantamweight fight, Zhao Long, 26 and 7. Chang Ho Li from South Korea is 9 and 1. And our final matchup. Rong Zhu is back against Shin Haraguchi. Um, Rong Zhu had been in the UFC before, got cut. He's back after it, trying to get another shot in the UFC. This is at lightweight, by the way, 155 pounds. And as for Shin Haraguchi, 7-0. You know, he turns uh, 25 November 27th, and he's uh, back, for some, uh, back for some revenge. But I kind of just wanted to uh, theorize, or what is it, um, speculate what the main event could be. Because I have three guesses at the moment. I have three guesses at the moment. Um, I can't recall if Song Ye Dong got hurt or if it was Peter Yan. Because I believe it was Song Ye Dong or else they would have rebooked it. Or maybe it might have been Peter Yan. But number seven, Song Ye Dong was supposed to fight number five, Peter Yan, in the bantamweight division in the main event. Unfortunately, one of them pulled out, but it was so long ago. I just cannot for the life of me remember who it was, um, I, I know Song Ye Dong had been coming off of a big win over um, Ricky Simone, it was. But um, as for Peter Yan, he, of course, had been on a terrible losing streak. Very, very unfortunate. And um, I, they were supposed to fight. It was supposed to be a big shot for Song Ye Dong. Unfortunately, that fight fell through. But I don't know. I believe it was, um, yes, it was actually Peter Yang got injured, so Song Ye Dong will remain on the card. So they're probably working out fights for Song Ye Dong. He could fight anyone below him, probably. Maybe someone like number nine ranked Dominic Cruz, number 11 Jonathan Martinez, maybe even number 12 Umar Nurmagomedov. We also have a welterweight in Li Jing Liang. Li has been trying to get back to UFC for a while. He is also from China. He fights at welterweight. And we could give him a big shot maybe against number 14 ranked Michael Chiesa. Maybe book him versus number 12 Kevin Holland. He was supposed to fight both of those guys. Both of those fights fell through. This could be a good time to make it. Another one is trying to get Yang uh, Chayonen. She's the number two woman strawweight on the card. Anyone below her. Um, this would have been a perfect time to do Zhang Wei Li versus Yan Chaonin. Zhang, of course, the woman's strawweight champion. Freaking love her. She is so dominant. But um, sadly, I don't think she's going to be able to make it. But yes, UFC Shanghai 
goes down uh, December 9th at the um, Shanghai Outdoor Arena. I, I don't know if this fight's going to actually be outdoors, but that would be super cool if they had an event outdoors. But uh, yeah, going to be interesting to see what fights they're able to put together. And I, I hope I hope they're able to uh, get everything together as well. And I'll tell you some things that have been coming together are some new movie trailers I watched two today. Um, they have this new movie coming out in 2024 called Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes. The Planet of the Apes movie is my favorite trilogy of all time. I believe this follows Caesar's son. Caesar, the main character from the original trilogy, or not the original, but the newest trilogy. And he basically ventures into this new world where the apes have fully evolved, you know? They're basically humans at this point. They can talk, they can walk, and they are the kingdom now. They rule the earth. And uh, it looks pretty good. They're just, I can't believe these aren't real apes. They look so realistic. Uh, CGI is getting off the charts. I don't even know what to do anymore with it, but um, it looks amazing. They were showing like, um, oh, what were they showing? They were showing like destroyed ships, destroyed cities, and like new king kingdoms. They actually have like kingdoms with different rulers. It looks amazing. Comes out Memorial Day. So we do got to wait over a year, but or almost a year. And uh, I'm so excited for that, though. Uh, the first, if I were to rank my trilogies, that is my favorite trilogy. I might actually add that to um, next week's episode, Rank Trilogies. That could be super fun. Would have been a good, good tie-in today, but not so much. Uh, but yes, Ranking Trilogies could be something fun to do. But love that movie. And Ryan Gosling, my well, I'd say my favorite actor, but he's one of my favorites. He's back in a movie with uh, John Krasinski's wife, Emily Blunt, in Fall Guy. Basically, Emily Blunt's a producer. Uh, Ryan Gosling plays a stuntman who has to find the main lead. There's a little romance. It looks good. Sign me up. Probably going to come out on Netflix. I don't know when that drops. I believe it's March, potentially. Trying to remember what the trailer said, but it looked good. And I always love Ryan Gosling movies. I mean, who doesn't? Who doesn't love a little Ryan Gosling in their life? Always exciting. Keeping the information train going. We last checked in with the NBA. This might be a weekly occurrence. And um, the uh, who was it? The Celtics were undefeated, the Mavericks were undefeated, and the Nuggets were undefeated. But no longer, as the Nuggets actually lost to the Timberwolves yesterday, leaving the Mavericks at 4-0 and the Celtics at 4-0 as the only undefeated teams. Very cool stuff there. Everyone in the Eastern Conference has a win. The Heat are currently at the bottom at 1-4. They're on a four-game losing streak, so they are last in the East and in the West. Mavericks 4-0 still, a little four-game win streak for them, keeping it rolling, Warriors in second, Nuggets in third, both are 4-1, and one. Timberwolves now 2-2, two and two, jump up to 9, it's going to take at least 20 games in to actually get like a read of where we're at, only winless team now in the NBA is the Grizzlies who are 0-5, Rockets picked up their first win last night, and man, it has just been quite the start to the season, rookies have been taking over, I saw Chet Holgram doing good, um, who is it, Jaden Ivey or Jaden? Jaden someone on the Pistons. He was looking good. But, I mean, let me just shout out the um, the uh, blah, blah, blah. I hate the word. I hate when I say that. It's a pet peeve when I notice it in speeches. So it's even worse when I'm using it and I catch myself. But I want to mention the Timberwolves last night. Uh, Anthony, I just said it again. Anthony Edwards dropping 24 points. Cat dropping 21 points was able to hold back the Nuggets. Nikola Jokic, though, 25 points, 10 rebounds. He cannot stop this guy. He is so dominant. We'll be checking in with the NBA all year long into uh, June. Wow, that's when the playoffs are. I got to catch a game this year. It'll be me and my boys, me and my two buddies, Tyler and Dane. They love the NBA as much as I do. So we'll see We'll see if we can catch a game with them. Uh, also, a big, big performance yesterday. Celtics beat the Pacers 155 to 104, absolutely insane. They scored 46 points in the fourth. The stat sheet, it's not that impressive. Jason Tatum dropped a 30-point, 12-rebound game. Peyton Pritchard had 15. Sam Hauser, 17. Derek White, 18. Chris Stapps had 13. Drew Holiday, 15. Jalen Brown, 16. Just an all-around collective good performance from the team, but scoring 155 points in a game is insane. It's, it's just something I want to make note of. But we'll move on from the NBA into the MLB, where we do have World Series champions as the Texas Rangers beat the Diamondbacks in five games. They closed them out five rip two in five games, five and oh in the fifth. Love it. Beating the Diamondbacks, winning their first ever World Series. And this is actually a very unfortunate fact. 
they are now not only did they break the longest of the big four North American sports drought, um, NHL, NBA, NFL, and uh, MLB, NBA, NHL, and NFL. Yes, of those four big leagues, of the longest team without since being created without winning a championship, they broke that. Meaning the Vikings are now the longest. That's right. Created in 1961, the Vikings have not won a uh, championship, uh, per se, like the Super Bowl, World Series, Stanley Cup, NBA championship. But good job to the Rangers. You got to feel good for them. They, uh, I believe they were like the fifth seed in their division. And, I mean, on the year, where did they even land? They went 90-72. and 72. They were second in the AL West this team wasn't overly dominant. They were middle of the pack, but they were able to separate themselves and win. Very, very good win for the Texas Rangers. Always good to win the World Series. Such a such a staple of North American sports. And it was actually pretty crazy. The Rangers, it was 1-0 heading into the top of the ninth, and the Rangers scored four runs to close it out. Who got the um runs? It was uh, Marcus Simeon home run, yes, I mentioned. And uh, Garver had an RBI. Jay Heem had an RBI. Oh, Matt S- Marcus Simeon actually had two RBIs. I'm going to be honest. I don't know who these players are, but congratulations to the Texas Rangers. I'm no um, I'm no MLB expert, as I've mentioned many a times, but congratulations to you guys for winning the, the World Series because, I mean, the World Series is just a cool, cool trophy. I really like it. The, like... Um, how do, how would you describe the World Series trophy? Just like the the rising beams, it's like in a circle. That makes no sense. But yes, uh, good times for the uh, MLB fans. Uh, but your season is sadly over. So I uh, hope you like your off season before you have to watch 162 more games. You know, if you watch UFC, you get one fight night, like pretty much every Saturday, which is what I prefer. I'll tell you what else I prefer is a good TV show. All right, and my uh, my roommate, he was heading home for the n- couple of days, and he told me, Zach, um, you know, you watch Invincible? And I was like, nah, I've, I've not seen Invincible. You know, it's that animated show. To be honest, I don't watch animated shows. And he's like, give it a shot, because guess what? We're going to watch every new episode when it airs on Amazon Prime on Fridays. And I was like, all right, I'll check it out. Watching the first episode, and, you know, first off, spoiler warning, because I'm going to go through the whole first season right here, so... Uh, I don't know when it's going to end, but just a spoiler warning ahead for anyone who hasn't seen Invincible. I'm watching the show. You know, it's all right. It's about Mark. You know, he's the he gets these superpowers, and his name is Invincible, which is pretty funny. They always do this cool the title card for Invincible. It did, it debuts whenever someone goes to say the word for the first time in the episode, and it's also a cool thing is they show blood splattering over the title card every episode. And it continues to uh, uh, get more. Mm, what what is what word am I searching for? It continues to get more bloody, I guess, if the uh, as the episodes continue on. And basically, you know, what's going on? He has this crush on his girl. He has his friends and stuff. And then there's this. How can I? It's basically like the Justice League, the Avengers of their world. It's called like the Guardians of the ga- ga- Galaxy or something. The Guardians of the Earth. And the uh, main villain, or he's the main hero, I should say. If the show, not to spoil it, is Omni Man, who is from Vit- Vitrolite. He's a Vitrolite or something, a Vitrillium or something, something with a Vitra in it. And he's an alien race, and he's super powerful. He's like Superman, like Homelander from The Boys. And basically, he kills the whole team, and it's so bloody, and it's just a crazy way to end the first episode. And it leaves you going, "Holy cow! I have to see what happens next. This is absolutely insane." So. Heading into episode two, um, we meet Adam Eve, who's on this other team of like, it's called like the young kids, basically like these teenagers who are superheroes, and Mark starts to fall for her, and um, you know, they're battling these aliens, which were super cool, I mean, the show just has so many cool aspects to it, the villains they produce, and then it basically ends, in one of the coolest scenes in episode two is Omni-Man goes into the aliens universe and destroys their entire race, it is absolutely crazy, and Omni-Man was just such a cool character, I was rocking with them. Episode two is going good. Then we get into episode three, and they're basically there's this government organization that supported the God, the Guardians or whatever, the team that was killed. And so the leader of it, who's basically like, hey, we, they're like, he's like a, how did, how would I compare it? He has like superpowers. He can like teleport of sorts, and basically he creates a new team, gets it going. 
And then Eve actually gets cheated on the episode, which is, it just, I can tell they're like kind of setting up that uh, Pam and Jim relationship from The Office where uh, Eve gets cheated on. And then she's like, oh, Mark said he had a crush on me. I'm going to go see him. And Mark was ending up with another girl who's not as hot as Eve, I should say. Not to say that cartoon characters are hot. You know what I'm saying. Eve sees and it gets all interesting. And by the way, there's these blue dudes who are actually the first. Oh my gosh, I'm getting so off track. There are so many voice actors in this show. It is absolutely crazy. It's just, I find it so fascinating how many people are in on this. But there's these blue guys that are voiced actually by. He is the villain from. Uh, trying to think from guardians of the galaxies rome romans like secondhand man you know the uh the black guy he's super he's a super popular actor um i'm trying to remember his name but yeah he voices them he's been in other shows you guys would recognize him and he basically he is voices these two uh, bl giant blue guys who are like can't die to bullets or whatever they're super funny we're getting into episode four now um, there's been this like demon detective trying to solve the case and he finds out that Omni-Man was the one who killed the whole team and was like, what, why is this going on? Mark heads to, uh, Mark Invincible, who he is, he's the main character of the show. He journeys to Mars cause he was supposed to like watch this team of, uh, astronauts who are exploring it. And basically <laughs> he goes to this planet and this alien race is there and they tell him, Hey, if one of these alien creatures that are just like. No, like they're basically like face suckers they look like starfish they like latch the faces if one of these gets onto one of your astronauts they'll kill our entire planet and it's super funny because mark is like that won't happen and you see all the aliens make it uh all the humans make it back successfully and as the episode ends it shows an alien taking over one of the astronauts and like a, an army of them taking over the planet and some of that dark humor type of stuff and then the episode ends because they always have to do like a little post credit scene at the end Besides the uh, final episode, of course, episode eight, where they see that you see this weird guy in a tank where you find out that this character called Robot is actually this guy who's been in a tank and wants to transfuse his body into a younger body. So then episode five, we get into the storyline with this granite man. I mean, he was from like the first episode. He was just some vigilante and he helps take on this crazy like uh how do i put it basically like a crime lord i'd put him like in the like a penguin from the batman universe sort of like a crime lord like that but this one's like a robotic guy he's like a robotic face human body and basically they go there and they end up fighting all of these mark is there alone with this granite man and they end up fighting all of these bob uh, henchmen per se from different universes who the uh uh, penguin like character brought in and I thought they almost killed invincible in the episode Mark almost dies it's crazy and the plot twist at the end is after they've defeated everyone granite man's the only one left is that you find out that granite man was actually in with some of the uh, boss man's henchmen and he actually takes over as the crime lord which was a pretty cool twist at the end episode six kicks off we have a little college visit this is where we kind of find out that Omni-Man is evil. We sort of find out that something's not right as his wife, who's just a normal human, begins to suspect things. And he um this is where this is where uh this is where things get a little uh little crazy heading into episode seven, where Omni-Man starts fighting basically everyone, and they actually bring back this guy called Immortal, who is one of like the guardians of the world and he completely, he comes back, they're able to transfuse his, like, head back together, and he goes to fight Omni-Man, and Omni-Man kills him. He chops off his head, chops his body in half, but there was news cameras, so the whole world sees, so everyone sees, and then Mark confronts him, and Omni-Man's like, I have something to tell you, I haven't been completely honest with you, I need to, I need to speak to you. And episode 8 kicks off, and you figure out that Omni-Man was not sent to Earth to protect us, but to conquer them. The Vitramites or whatever, his race of alien people, they are superior. They just, they use their powers for evil. Only the strongest can survive. And he wants, um, basically to, I'm trying to, I put it, basically like conquer the planet or like enslave the planet. And he wants Mark to help him. Mark, Mark says, no, what about mom? And he says, your mother was only just a 
like a speck in the thousands of years of my life. So they end up fighting. Basically, Mark almost dies. But you see just a little of hope in Omni-Man that there's still some good in him. And he ends up flying away at the end of the episode. And basically, it's left with Omni-Man to be the new protector of the Earth along with the Guardians of the Globe. That's what it was, Guardians of the Globe. And just a pretty cool end to the season. But the voice actors, I was going to get back to that. Steven Yoon, who's from, uh, who, what show is that called with the zombies? I'm trying to remember, The Walking Dead. He's, um, he's uh, what's his name? In Glenn. He's Glenn from The Walking Dead. He plays the main character. Absolutely amazing voice acting there. J.K. Simmons portrays uh, Omni-Man. You also have Sandra Oh. She is the mother in the show. Sandra Oh. What, sh what shows have Sandra Oh been in? Another recognizable face. I'll say where you can easily rest. Saturday Night Live, she's hosted. Grey's Anatomy, that's where you would recognize her from. She's Dr. Christina Yang. So she must be one of the main characters on that show. I personally, I personally don't know. I've never seen Grey's Anatomy. I was talking to this girl, gosh, almost four years ago, who was all about Grey's Anatomy. Me personally, not into that. Mark Hamill is in the show, of course, Luke Skywalker. Who does he voice? Oh my goodness. I, I had no idea who he voiced in the show. What's, um, what's, I'm trying, I'm trying to peek around. He is, Hamill has done so much voice acting. He's done Joker, Batman, Hobgoblin, and Spider-Man, the animated series, Avatar, The Last Better, The, uh, the Last Airbender, regular show, Brigsby Bear. My goodness. He has done so many things. Mark Hamill, you are just amazing. He, he was such a good looking, um, he, you know what, I'll say he's still good looking now, but man, he was a good looking guy before he got in a car accident, unfortunately. You also have Seth Rogen, he plays this funny character that is like this, uh, he was like fighting um, Mark in the show Invincible, I'll say. And basically it was like, oh, do you want to use your timeout? And Mark's like, what? And he's like, oh yeah, everyone gets a timeout mid-fight. And that was super funny. Seth Rogen, such a good guy, such a good uh, uh, voice actor for that. You also have Jillian Jacobs. She's from Community. She plays. Um, who does she play? I wish I wish it listed. She plays Adam Eve. Okay, so she plays Adam Eve, the the future love interest, we'll say, of Mark. You also have Andrew Ranelles. Andrew was in Hairspray, Boys in the Man, Jersey Boys, The Book of Mormon. Don't really recognize him, but. Recognizable face, Zazie, Zazie Beats is in the show, Walton Goggins, oh, Walton Goggins, he was in um, The Shield, he's been in, what other show, this is a very recognizable guy, Did Django Unchained, The Hateful Eight, Maze Runner, The Death Cure, Tomb Raider, Ant-Man, The Wasp, he was the villain, yes, that's what I was looking for, another notable name, and Jason Mantazoukas, oh my gosh, he plays this one character, I just, he, he plays, who does he play, Rexplode, oh my gosh, He's just like the same character. I mean, he's from Big Mouth, The Good Place. He's from The Dictator. He's from, oh my gosh. He is so funny. One of my favorite comedians uh, in the game. May May Whitman, she has been in nothing I recognize her from. Chris D Diamantolapas. He was in The Three Stooges. Uh, Max Burkholder. A lot of notable names, I will say. But yes, very good stuff. I'm excited for season two on what it holds. And honestly, I think that Omni Man's going to come back and try and take over the planet with some of his, some of his uh, people, or whatever you want to call it. And honestly, my future prediction, I'm going to say it right now on this episode, episode 38 of the Surprise Jet Podcast, UFC, um, UFC Sao Paulo predictions. That I think Omni Man is starting to take over the planet with everyone. He starts to see Mark die again, and he turns his back and sacrifices himself, killing off the rest of his uh, enemies for the uh, to save the day of sorts. But I don't know if that's gonna be in this season. If we even get a season three, season one came out in 2021, so it has been over two years since it last came out. It's crazy. I just watched it, and a new episode drops tomorrow. So that's another show I'll add to my watch list as Gen V. I mean, I'm wrapping up Gen V with my uh, buddy, my roommate. Um, gonna be wrapping that up, the final episode. And there's actually a new episode of Loki out. I believe that there's five, six, seven. They're actually oh five and six. So there's only two episodes left of Loki, I believe. And I'm winding down the Sopranos as well. I'm running out of shows to watch. I'll always have Kill Tony every Monday. Kill Tony, a show with uh, Tony Hinchcliffe, who's like a comedian. That's a funny show. I think I think I've mentioned that before. 
But we'll steer away from Invincible and we'll steer ahead to week number. What are we in now? I mentioned it. Week nine of the NFL. Absolutely crazy. Absolutely crazy. Already in week nine of the NFL. It's been a good season and we have a number of games left this week. We do have a couple teams on the bye. We have uh, the Broncos thankfully getting on a bye. My goodness, Broncos need a bye. Actually, no, they're on a little two-game win streak. I stand corrected. Broncos getting a bye as they're heating up. The Lions will be getting a bye. Uh, six and two now. One one game win streak. Just hit 200 points scored for the year in their uh, latest matchup. We'll be interested to see what happens when they come back. The Jaguars, definitely, I don't know, they needed a bye. Jaguars have been red hot. They're on a five-game win streak, 6-2, and two, tied for first in the AFC. They've been doing pretty good as of late. The Jaguars, led by uh, Travis Etienne, we'll say. And lastly, the 49ers, who if there's a team that needs a bye, it's the 49ers. They were 5-0. and They're now 5-3. and It's been collapse, collapse, collapse. I mean, and this offense was so good early on. Not looked too hot lately. 49ers desperately in need of a bye. We'll talk about the game that's going down tonight. Um, Titans versus the Steelers in Pittsburgh. My prediction, we're going with the Titans in this one, there's just something about Derrick Henry on Thursday night that I think just just really gets me going. I think that's going to be the key to victory for this Titans team. And the Titans, look, they're three and four. All right. And in the AFC South, Texans, Titans, Colts, all in the race, all in the running. They're all pretty even. Will Levis is getting his first official NFL start. He popped off for four touchdowns last week. I think the Titans can do it against the Steelers as the Steelers offense is not good They are, if I'm not correct, they are the worst offense in the AFC, and only the Giants are worse than them. Yeah, this uh, this offense is pretty bad. The defense is the core of the Steelers team. Steelers are four and three though. They are coming off of a loss last week um, to the who did the Steelers lose to last week? I'm trying to recall. I'm trying to recall who they've played last week. I mean, the weeks just seem to flow together. The Steelers played. They weren't on a bye. Every team played last week. Steelers played the Jaguars. Oh, so that's an understandable loss. Jaguars have been red hot. But yes, we're going to be riding with the Titans tonight. Big things from Derrick Henry of sorts. I know people are going to be looking for big things of Will Levis. And I got to choose between George Pickens or Zach Moss on who to start in fantasy and I'm leaning, honestly, towards starting Zach Moss. I, this offense is too unpredictable of the Steelers. I'm going to need to see some more improvement from Kenny Pickett or Mitch Trubisky, whoever plays tonight, before I can offer an official prediction. But yes, we're going with the Titans tonight over the Steelers. Now let's get into our 12 o'clock games. I am going to be at a party for my girlfriend's brother's birthday. He turned 16. Going to be a very special birthday indeed for specific reasons. If anyone's watched me and Lexi's episode, Lexi's brother is terminally ill, so we treasure every birthday we can. Should be very fun. Um, it's a very fun time Sunday, but um, I'm going to be missing all the games probably. So Monday when we do a recap of week... Uh, actually, Monday or Tuesday when I do a recap of week... Nine and a recap of UFC Brazil. We'll have to, um, we'll definitely have to uh, go back and watch all the highlights of the games without a doubt. Keeping it rolling though, I mean, the oh my gosh, this, this, the we're kicking off week nine with a bang as the Chiefs take on the Dolphins in, um, in Arrowhead Field, Arrowhead Stadium. Chiefs six and two now coming off of a loss. I mean, they've looked so good as of late. But the Dolphins also 6-2. and two. They've been looking good. This is the best offense in the league. Look, Dolphins, they're coming off of a big win last week. Or it, was, it, was, it was a much-needed victory over the Patriots. Patriots not proving to be easy for anyone. As for the uh, Chiefs, they sucked last week. The Broncos ran through them. Don't know what went wrong, personally. I, I, I have no words about what went wrong. But I, I all I can say is that This is going to come down to a defensive battle because both offenses are super talented. And just a part of me thinks that the Chiefs aren't going to lose back-to-back games. I think the Dolphins, their only losses are to the Bills 
and to the Eagles. So they're only losing to top teams. And I think because it's in Kansas City, the Chiefs get this done. They might even go down early. But I'm going to ride with Patrick Mahomes. He's my QB in my six-man All-Star League. I need Travis Kelsey to do good. I need Isaiah Pacheco to do good. And on the Dolphins side, on the Dolphins side, Raheem Mostert, do your thing. Tyreek Hill. Tyreek Hill, I need you to beat Tyreek Hill on a whole nother level. We're riding with the Chiefs over the Dolphins. But if there's going to be any match, if I get wrong, it's that one. And for all things I just mentioned, very much the same thing could happen. And I could predict this next one wrong. As my Vikings, they do play at noon, so I will miss the game, as I mentioned. But they will be taking on the Falcons, which I do believe is a winnable game. Taylor, 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 Taylor Heineke will be taken over in place of Desmond Ritter for the Falcons. Now, I, I just think our main things could be our run defense. I'm not really scared of Drake London, Joni Smith, Kyle Pitts. I'm not really scared of those guys. I'm scared of Bijan running through us. I'm scared of Ty Algier. Even if Cordell Patterson gets the ball, I'm scared that he's going to run through us. Of course, the Vikings without Kirk Cousins from now on. We did get Josh Dobbs. We did get Josh Dobbs. Love Josh Dobbs, by the way. Josh Dobbs is my boy. But um, Jaron Hall will be getting the start. We'll see how he does. Alexander Madison, Cam Akers might be getting some more touches. We'll have to see how Jaron Hall does, man. We'll have to see how he does. But we have to adjust. We have to move on from this Kirk situation. I really hope we don't trade him, honestly. This has made me love Kirk even more than I did. I've never been a Kirk hater. I've been a Kirk supporter. I just hate when people are mean to him. And let's just let's just hope we can get through this unscathed because we can't take any more injuries. All right, Jay, we get JJ back soon. The playoffs are a real possibility for us. And we could move our win streak to, what is it, five now? We, I think we could be on a five-game win streak here. What, what, are, what are we at currently? The Vikings are on a three-game win streak. Okay, we're four and four, as I should have known. Yes, we'll move to a four-game win streak if we win this. As for the Falcons, let me just say, they're at top of the NFC South technically, but they're tied with the Saints. They are, do not have a positive points for to points against ratio. They have a negative points differential by, what is it, 13, 23, minus 23. Vikings, we are plus 13, by the way. Really hoping the Vikings can pull through here. I'll be rooting for you, boys. We're going with the Vikings over the uh, Falcons, as always. And speaking of birds, we have a Seahawks versus Ravens matchup. This is another toss-up for me, if I won't lie. Seahawks are 5-2, and two, two-game win streak, plus 30-point differential. Tyler Lockett, DK Metcalf, and looking hot. I mean, Zach Charbonnet, Kenneth Walker, Geno Smith. This team has been rolling. So is the Ravens, though. So this is going to be a very interesting matchup. Ravens tied for first in the AFC, top of the AFC North by two games, six and two, little three-game win streak, crossed the 200 points for um, differential, and they actually have a plus 81-point differential. My goodness, this team is good. I'll be rooting for Gus Edwards, man. Gus has not let me down two weeks in a row. I love you, Gus Edwards. As for Lamar, I feel like I play Lamar every single week. Seahawks, Tyler Lockett, I'll be rooting for you. But um, I'm going to go with the Ravens in this one. Just surely, I just cannot pick against this Ravens team. I would rather pick against the Ravens than the Seahawks, looking at both of their teams. But Ravens in this one, an upset could happen. A matchup I'm actually fairly confident in is the Bears versus the Saints. I will be picking the Saints in this one. Rashid Shahid and Taysom Hill both may be getting starting spots in my lineup. They had very impressive weeks last week. And this Saints team... They're second in the AFC South, as I mentioned, tied with the Falcons. One win could boost them to the top, and the AFC South is pretty terrible this year. So one team just has to burst out and show that they want it, that they want it real bad. And you know what? I think they can do it. Chris Olave, don't know if I can start him. Derek Carr is unpredictable with who he throws to, but we shall see. Bears, 2-6. and six. They've given up 218 points. That's actually not the worst, surprisingly, but... Second to worst in the NFC, at least. They're coming off of a uh, loss last week to the... Oh my gosh, can I use my memory to remember who the Bears lost to last week? The Chargers on Sunday Night Football. Which, uh, Tyson Baggins, he's doing the best he can. But this Bears team is just not it. They're 2-6. and six. They are bottom of the NFC North, bottom of the league. Once the Panthers or Cardinals get two wins, I'm sure they might even pass him. But um, look, in this matchup, I'll just be looking at some of the oddballs. Taysom Hill, Rashid Shaheed, as I mentioned. We'll be looking for those types of players. Kicking us off, uh, oh, still in the 12 o'clock slot, Buccaneers and Texans. This is going to be a very interesting one. Toss up here. I am leaning towards the Bucs. The Buccaneers will be my predictions, my prediction for this game. 
as it's going to be. I don't know what to say. This Texans team is just so off. It's just so off sometimes. They they lost to the Panthers last week, choked that, but they are plus 20 point differential. Second in the a, uh, AFC South. They got a lot of work to do if they want to make the playoffs. C.J. Stroud doing the best he can. I mean, Nico Collins, Tank Dell, Dalton Schultz. They're coming out, um, trying their best every week. Damian Pearson, Devin Singletary, they just don't do much. Team's kind of awkward. But the Bucks, they have all the tools to succeed. If, if I'm being completely honest, they have all the tools to succeed. They're somehow third in the NFC South. They're on a three-game losing streak. They've just been falling apart at the end of games, minus seven-point differential. But Baker, if you can just pull it together, Mike Evans, Godwin, they'll be open. Even Otto, the tight end, he's doing his thing. Mike, Mike Evans, without a doubt, can pop off this week against this Texans team. But Baker's got to be there. Baker's got to be there to finish. He can start, but sometimes he can't finish. But this Texans team, I'm not betting uh, I'm not betting for them. I'm betting against them. We're going with the Bucks. Another good one, Cardinals and Browns. Don't know really what to make of this one. Cardinals now 1-7. Don't even know who their starting QB is. Some white boy, third string, is now the starting QB with Kyler Murray still out. They're on a five-game losing streak. They're, oh, my gosh, their point differential is in the minus 60s. It's uh, not looking too pretty for them. But that's not to say that the Browns have been doing too hot either. Another hit-or-miss team. Now they, I will say they're... They've had some close games. They do have a positive plus 15 point differential. It was a tough loss last week, obviously. Not the not ideal for that Browns team losing. But hey, if, if you can pull it together, as I said, I'm going to say it's for every team. If you can just pull it together, the AFC North is one of the best divisions in football right now. If you can pass to Amari Cooper, you know, if you can run it with Jerome Ford, you can get past the Cardinals. And I'll be honest, this is a winnable game. This Browns defense should pick apart the Cardinals. The Cardinals got nothing special going for them. But uh, keep your eyes on Trey McBride, though. Cardinals tight end. He is going to be uh, he's going to be an, uh, someone to keep your eye on this weekend. But yes, we're obviously picking the Browns. Heading into our ninth game, or our eighth game of the week, we have the Commanders visiting the Patriots. This one, I just, I don't know what to do, boys. I don't know what to do. The, the Patriots, they are 2-6. and six. They are minus 90 point differential. But they they seem to win some games when they need to. They, they seem to win sometimes. They're only coming off of one loss to the Dolphins last week. Gave them a run for their money. Now, as for the Commanders, they're 3-5. and five. They honestly, despite having given up 228 points, have scored 171 points. They're on a two-game losing streak, but Sam Howell continues to look better. I think he shreds the Patriots this week. I think we see a standout game from Sam Howell, and I think the Commanders get past the Patriots. But of all the teams, there's just so many uncertainties this week. The Patriots, they're at home. They tend to historically do better at home. But they have collapsed before, and I think the Commanders collapse here. We're going to ride with the Commanders in this one. Snap their little losing streak. And then we head to Los Angeles as the Rams take on the Packers. Jordan Love versus oh, Matt Stafford. Actually, Brett Ripien might be getting some uh, passes this weekend. But yes, the Rams will greet the Packers. Oh wait, no, they're in a they're in Lambo. We're in Lambo two weeks in a row now. Wow, Rams are three and five. A little two game losing streak. Only a minus nine point differential, which isn't too bad. Packers though, four game losing streak. Minus 14 point, di- minus 16 point differential just have been falling apart as of late. I, st- I do not think they get it together here. I think this Rams offense is better. I don't know if they're necessarily going to pop off Puka and Cooper, but we're going to ride with the Rams in this matchup. Colts will take on the Panthers, and I just, you know, sub's in the air. Sub is in the air. Sub, part of me wants to pick the Panthers. Obviously, one in six. Giving up almost 200 points, minus 72 point differential, but they got to win last week. And even if it was their first win of the season, maybe the only one they get all year, this could spark something. This could spark a movement, spark something to do. And by the way, Colts, they're three and five, three game losing streak. They've scored 205 points. They've given up 229 points, minus 24 point differential right there. I just, we're in, we're in um, Carolina. The Colts, obviously, Zach Moss has been doing his thing, looking good. I just, I feel like I got to pick the Panthers. I just feel like I do. I feel like I got to go against them. My family, they're all picking the Colts. You know, I can't really do the same. So I think I'm going to change my pick from Colts to Panthers, spice it up. I don't know 
who, who is, I don't know if Bryce Young can get it done, but guess what? I like picking the underdogs, and I don't really have too many underdogs picked looking at, looking at everyone. So we're going to change my pick from Colts to Panthers. My Panthers lock is official. And in what I can promise you will be the worst game of the week, the Giants will take on the Raiders in Las, uh, where are they at now? Las, Las Vegas? The Las Vegas the Raiders? Um, Raiders 3-5, and five, two-game losing streak, just fired their head coach and their GM. Bye-bye, Josh McDaniels. Jimmy Garoppolo's getting benched this week. This Raiders team is in shambles. And a team that's almost more in shambles is the Giants, 2-6. and six. Haven't even crossed the 100-point mark this season for scoring. They're at 95. This is a terrible team, but I honestly think that the Raiders are failing drastically, and I'm going to pick the Giants in this one. Derek Waller might be out for some time, but I'll tell you, Tyrod Taylor, do your thing. Or put in Tommy DeVito. Put in put in that Italian mobster. How about you? How about you? All right. Let's keep it rolling, which, I mean, Chiefs and Dolphins is going to be good, but how about this? Cowboys at the Eagles. I mean, oh, my goodness. Cowboys. Five and two, two game win streak, almost at 200 points for one of the best, if not the best, probably the best offense. I mean, defense in the league. And if the off, if the defense gets going, the offense can get going. C.D. Lamb had a 41 point fantasy performance last week. Dak Prescott was slanging it. Jake Ferguson caught a tutty. The defense got another tutty. They looked phenomenal. However, you know, as good as this Cowboys team is, this is a divisional matchup, a winnable game for them. This Eagles team is 7-1, two-game win streak, 221 points for. They just know how to win games. They are so talented, and I'm going to pick the Eagles in this one. I don't think I've, I really picked the Cowboys. I'm not a huge Cowboys fan for some reason, but I got to pick the Eagles in this one. It just it just feels like they're going to move to 8-1. and one. But if there's going to be a team that upsets them, it would be the Cowboys because this, this Cowboys team, they lose their Cardinals one week, they blow out the Rams another week. It makes no sense. Sunday Night Football gets us, oh, this one. This might be game of the week. You know, I just keep getting upped and upped and upped. The Bills versus the Bengals. We're in Cincinnati. The rematch. Obviously, last time we were out there, uh, actually, was it? Where were we in um, Cincinnati? When the, this is the first time they played since the DeMar Hamlin incident, of course. DeMar Hamlin injuring himself in that game. T. Higgins is coming for revenge. He's gonna have. He's gonna go off this game. Joe Mixon's back. Joe Burrow's back. Jamar Chase wants to get after it. It's gonna be a good game. And the Bills, Stephon Diggs, man, Josh Allen. I mean, James Cook. They just signed Larry Fournette to the practice squad. Maybe they'll call him up. This is gonna be a good one. I got ride with the Bills though. I got ride with the Bills. I just. I think the Bills team is better. Josh Allen's having himself a good year. And that's just how I feel, man. That's just how I feel. But you know what? If the Bengals can keep their little win streak rolling, good for them. But we're going with the Bills in this one. And then we head on down to uh, Monday Night Football, Chargers and Jets in New York. Look, all I can say, Jets did good on Monday night one night. This Chargers team, they're hot. Jets offense, I just i am not too confident in. But uh, yes, we'll be riding with the Chargers in this one. Justin Herbert have another game. Play on Sunday Night Football. Play on Monday Night Football. Good for you, Chargers. Getting your prime time spots in. Yeah, it should be a good week. And if all things hold true, the Vikings could move up to a 5-4, and four, which would be very good. But yes, let me just recap my picks. We got the Titans tonight. Chiefs, Vikings, Ravens, Saints, Browns, Bucks, Commanders, Rams, Panthers, Giants, Eagles, and the Bills on Sunday. And to cap us off on Monday, the Chargers. Should be a good should be a good week nine. I'm excited for it. And any big shifts that we can really see um, in the NFC, in the NFC itself, the Eagles will remain number one, even if they lose. The best case scenario is the Cowboys could be tied with the Lions. And if the Seahawks win, they could be tied as well for the number two spot. As for the AFC, AFC's wide open, man. Jaguars will move to uh, th- move to third no matter what, I believe. But Ravens could go seven and two. Dolphins and Chiefs, one of them is going to be seven and two. One's going to be six and three, unless we get a tie. And even if the Bills win, they could move to six and three. This could be a good week. I get that. I got that feeling that this is going to be a good week of fights. And I'll tell you what. Oh, fights? What? That's not what I meant to say. I meant to say a football. But since you're speaking of fights, I mean, I suppose we could talk about UFC Sao Paulo, the event going down in Brazil. I am so thrilled for that. It's going to be an absolute blast. I have uh, all sorts of notes that I'm going to go over for all the fighters. I'm very excited for it. 
let me just, before we get into UFC Brazil, first off, the PFL Championships, PFL, another MMA organization, is going down before we know it. I believe that happens in two weeks, three weeks or something. So we'll be covering those fights. Former UFC fighter Derek Brunson is going to be debuting with the promotion, the return of Kayla Harris, and we get like five championship fights. It's, it's going to be a good card. And whoever wins the heavyweight belt in this matchup could be taking on Francis Ngannou before they know it. So we'll be covering that on a future episode whenever that goes down. But as for now, we're going to be giving our full card predictions for UFC South. Paulo. I'm actually going to take a quick little break. I'll be back in a zip, and then we'll cover all the fights for UFC Brazil. All right, ladies and gentlemen, as always, the final segment of most episodes. Most episodes, we are able to talk about a UFC event, whether recapping or predicting of sorts. Today, we are blessed to be predicting and talking about all the fights going down at UFC Sao Paulo. That's right, Sao Paulo, Brazil, the host of uh, this Saturday's fight night. I don't actually know the time it goes down. I assume it's going to have a Sort of a midday start of sorts. I, I hope so, unless it's at night. Beats me, but let's talk about it because we got a lot of fights to get through and all the time to talk about it. So without a doubt, let's kick off our early prelims. They're actually just normal prelims. Early prelims are only for pay-per-views. With a lightweight matchup between Cal Fernandez and the UFC veteran Mark Bonecrusher Diakise. I didn't even know that was Mark's nickname. Cal is 8 and 1, Mark is 16 and 7, Mark is 5'10, Cal 5'9, so 1 inch to Mark. Both fighters have a 73 inch reach and have an orthodox style. Mark is 30 years old, Cal is 28, both born in March. Actually, Mark was born March 16th and Cal was born March 17th, so they almost share the same birthday. This will be Cal Fernandez, UFC debut. He is from Rio de Janeiro, Brazil. So we have a Brazilian native here today. He is uh, of his eight victories, four by knockout, two by submission. He's on a little two-fight win streak heading into this one. I wish him luck. Mark Diakise, his opponent, 16-7 and seven record. I mean, he has been in the UFC since 2016. This is year five for him. Um, he's been kind of an average fighter. He's currently on a two-fight losing streak, unfortunately. Fought earlier this year in July. Got submitted in round two by Joel Alvarez. Joel Alvarez, a very talented, unranked lightweight. For that, he had lost the decision to Michael Johnson in December of 2022. Last win came in uh, March and July of 2022. He had a little two-fight win streak where he used his grappling to beat Vicheslav Borshev and Demir Hadzovic. Um, some of his most notable fighters he's fought is Rafael Fiziev. Top 10 UFC lightweight. He's uh, fought Dan Hooker. Lost to, lost to both of those men. But besides that, he's picked up, what is it, seven wins in the UFC and seven losses. So, ooh, this could be a make or break for Mark. I wish him nothing but the luck. But uh, we, it'll be, I'll be interested to see how Cow does. I mean, size-wise, they're pretty similar. This is short notice for Cal Fernandez. And I'm always, I'm, I'm very intrigued by this because Mark, it's it's probably going to be a grappling approach for him. That's what he's been doing his last few fights. But as for Kyle, you know, you're new here. UFC debut, you're in Brazil. So just just because of that, s simply because Kyle is from Brazil, we're riding with him. We're going to go with Kyle Fernandez, pulling off a little upset here over Mark Diakise, if you want to call it that. Uh, I don't really know the method. I'd say by, probably by submission, too. I mean, Mark got caught last time in a Darce choke. What makes me think that Cal can't do it here? He has two subs on his name, does have more knockouts, but we're going to go with Cal Fernandez, winning his UFC debut short notice against a guy in Mark Diakise. Interesting to see. Heading on down to a woman's straw weight, the 115 pounders, we have Eduarda Ronda Mora taking on Montessera Canijo Ruiz. Eduarda, this will be her first UFC debut coming from the Contender Series this past season, season seven. She'll be debuting this year uh, on this event against Montserrat Koniju, who's had three fights in the UFC. Eduarda, 9 and 0, Montserrat, 10 and 3. Six inch height advantage for Eduarda, 5'6 to 5 foot, and she has a 5 inch reach advantage as well, 66 inches to 61. She fights Orthodox, Montserrat fights Southpaw. This should be a very interesting one here. Um, Eduarda is 29 years old. Montessarit is 30. So pretty similar there. Eduarda, three KOs and five submissions of her nine career victories. She is from Bahia, Brazil. And on the contender series, she actually, um, beat 
uh, Jania Silva by round one submission submitted her in four minutes on the second episode of that season was able to earn a contract impressive stuff from her there any other big fights on that episode I don't remember it too well even though we recapped all of them but Eduarda 9-0 undefeated making her UFC debut Montesarit, ten a uh, little two fight losing streak, unfortunately. Now one of those losses is to Amanda Lemos, and her last loss was August twelfth, where she got TKO'd in the third round by Jacqueline Amorim. She did win her UFC debut over Cheyenne Villismas, used her grappling to win that one. But other than that, nothing impressive. And by the way, Montesarit, she's she's Latina, she's a Latino, and she's down here in Brazil against Eduarda, who's making her UFC debut. We got to go with Eduarda. She's from Brazil, man. There's just something about Brazilian fighters in Brazil. I like it. We're going to give her a submission because of her eight, nine career victories, five are by submission. That clearly tells me that she is good. So, Eduarda, going to ride with you over Montessarit. Another woman's strawweight matchup between Angela over Kill Hill and Denise D. Gomez. By the way, Angela Hill ranked number 12 at women's strawweight. So, a big opportunity here for Denise Gomez. Um, Angela, 15 and 13, Denise, 8 and 2, 5 foot 3 to 5 foot 2 in favor of Angela Hill, and 64 inch reach to 63 in favor of Angela as well. Both fighters fight orthodox. Angela, a veteran of the game, she's 38 years old. That is crazy to think. As for Denise, December 30th, 1999 is her birthday, meaning she is 23 at the moment. Um, almost, wow, almost on New Year's Day is her birthday. But yes, much uh, much younger, but similar size-wise in uh, between these two ladies. Angela Hill, I mean, ranked number 12, been in the game a while, been in the UFC since 2014. This is year nine for her. Incredible stuff. She's currently on a losing streak. She lost a Fight night to Mackenzie Dern, which was actually fight of the night. Mackenzie Dern, she just went off in that fight. Nothing more to say. But before that, she had two big wins over Emily Ducote and Lupi Godinez. Angel Hill, I mean, debuted in 2014 following her victory over Emily Kagan in her debut. Took on Tisha Torres, Rose Namajunas, and Jessica Andrade. Three straight killers. I mean, Ashley Yoder, Nia Nunes, Marina Moroz, pretty much all the women she's fought have been notable. Um, at one point in 2019 to February of 2020, she was on a three-fight win streak, including one TKO win over Hannah Cyphers. But following that, she had two disgustingly bad decisions. All right? Obviously, close, but in May of 2020, she lost a split decision to Claudia Gadella in a fight I thought she won. I think some a lot of people thought she won. In September of 2020 as well, she had a full fight night against Michelle Warson Gomez and lost a split decision. It was fight of the night, too. She got robbed there. She then took on Ashley Yoder, beat her, then did lose to Tisha Torres in August of 2021, and then had a loss to Amanda Lemos in December of 2021, which is highly disputed. Then had another close loss to Vina Jandaroba. She just loves close fights. She's a decision fighter. Her opponent, Denise Gomez, is 2-1 and one in the UFC, coming from uh, Season 6 of Dana White's Contender Series. She was born in Rio Grande Sul, Brazil, currently uh, trains in the United States. Of her, um, what is it now, 8 out of 2, out of her 8 career victories, 6 are by knockout, including none bigger than her last one over Yasmin Jarugue when she knocked her out in 20 seconds back in July at UFC 290, an insane upset that was. And before that, she had knocked out Bruna Brazil in April, uh, TKO'd her. Her only loss in the UFC is to Luma Luke Boomi, where she got out grappled. That was back in September of 2022. I think she's changed her game since then. But Angela Hill is not easy to put away on the feet, my dad. Angela Hill has not been finished since 2019 when she got armbarred. I doubt she's going to get finished here, but I think Denise Gomez has what it takes to get past Angela Hill, advance up the women's strawweight rankings. So we're going to go with Denise Gomez. Um, I got marked down. What uh what I predict? Cause I'm not gonna predict round except for the main card, but uh, I like to always mark down my prelim predictions as well. Actually, I should put them right here, right on this piece of paper that I'm writing on. But yeah, Denise Gomez, I remember her her uh, knockout of Jasmine. That was bad, and it was a huge upset. As I mean, not a lot of people had were pe were picking her to um win that fight. She was a big underdog. So able to get it done, and you know, Angela Hill is a huge step up in competition. She's she's like the Neil Magny, she's like Tim Elliott. She's a huge gatekeeper, and I just realized on every event I have done, uh, what round? So I'll say for uh, Cal Fernandez versus Mark D. Kise, 
I'm going to give him a round two, we'll say round two sub and Eduardo round one sub just to spice it up. Then we get in the, oh, we're moving on. This is, this is going to be a good one, guys. I tell you, these prelims are loaded. This is such a good card. I, f I feel spoiled getting this card, by the way. This is an amazing card, and the prelims just do not disappoint. Next up, Vitor Petrino versus Modestus Bukakis. Oh, my goodness. I, I don't even know what to make of this one, guys. This this one is going to be competitive. Vitor, 9-0 undefeated. Modestus, 15-5. This is at 205, light heavyweight. 6'3 to 6'2 in favor of Modestus and 78 to 77 in favor of Modestus. Just one inch difference. Uh, an orthodox stance for Vitor, switch stance for Modestus. Modestus is 29. As for Vitor Petrino, he is 26. Let's talk about Modestus, man. He's had a crazy UFC career. Debuted in 2020, had a win over Andres Micheldis after Andres couldn't continue after round one. Did get a performance bonus for it, messed it up pretty bad. Following that, did get TKO'd by Jimmy Crute in October of 2020 by in two minutes. But Jimmy Crute was a dog back then. Then lost a very close split decision to Michael Oka Jacek. Then had to fight Khalil Roundtree and got brutally leg kicked TKO'd. It was really bad, but Khalil is just an animal. And following that, he left the UFC, went and joined another fight promotion, became the champion there, stepped in on short notice at UFC 284 in February of this year, took on Tyson Pedro, upset him. It was crazy. UFC gave him another chance. And in June of this year, he beat Zach Pauga by unanimous decision. Modestus is 2-0 in this year, 2-0 since his return. And I honestly like him. His nickname's the Baltic Gladiator. Okay, that's a badass nickname, the Baltic Gladiator. And this is one of those fights where, like, I actually kind of root for him, man. He's 15-5. and five. We'll see how he does. I know his father's in his corner, which had some pressure. But we'll have to see. He is taking on Vitor Petrino, though. Vitor, 9-0, and as I mentioned. Six KOs and one submission of all those victories. From Minas Gervais, Brazil, another Brazilian fighter. I mean, I'm just going crazy on Brazilian fighters. Three so far, and I predicted them all to win. And Vitor came from Season 6 of Dana White's Contender Series. Um, got a knockout victory on there. But um, his UFC debut was a fight of the night win over Anton Tarkoljic. And in July of this year, in 2023, he beat Marcin Pracinio by round three arm triangle. Used his grappling heavily in this one. Which is very surprising, being that he has six KO victories, that he's a big grappler. But, I mean, in that fight, four takedowns, eight minutes and 39 seconds of control time. Marcin had nothing to offer him. Modestus just capitalized on it. This is a very close one, guys. I, I won't lie. I'm very torn. It's it's just one of those, you know, Vitor's undefeated, but he necessarily hasn't been, like, the most, like, dominant or, like, oh, I'm scared of him. But, and Modestus is low-key my boy. I low-key rock with Modestus, and even though Vitor is from Brazil, you know, I'd rather pick Modestus and be wrong than pick Vitor and be right. So we're going to go with a little upset here, Modestus Bukakis. That's going to be my upset pick of the prelims, I believe, to win. And just because, actually, you know what? We're going to do it. Round 2 KO just for the upset. You know, I, lo I, I love picking it. I love picking the upsets. This whew, some good prelims. So we keep it moving. We keep it moving. But yes, Modestus Bukakis over Vitor Petrino by a round two knockout. Bantamweight matchup up next between Victor, Victor Striker Hugo, and Daniel Sancora. Marcos Daniel. Love him. He's from Spain. Uh, actually, no, he's from Peru. I was thinking of uh, Joel Alvarez. Yeah, Daniel Marcos from Lima, Peru. We'll be taking on Victor, Hen Victor Hugo from Santa Catina, Brazil. Ooh, Brazilian fighter, Peru fighter. Love to see it. Victor is 24-4. and Daniel is 15-0, and undefeated. Both men are 5-7, 71 inch reach to 69 inch reach in favor of Victor Hugo. Both fighters are orthodox, and both fighters are um, 30 years old. It's pretty cool there, but Victor's birthday is on November 22nd, so he'll be 31 before he knows it. Daniel Marcos, eight KOs of his 15 victories. He's 2-0 and in the UFC, a season 6 Dana White's contender alum. Got a contract on there. And his UFC debut in January at UFC 283, he TKO'd Sam and Oliveira in two minutes. And his last victory came in July when he beat Davey Grant by split decision. Very close fight was that one. His opponent, though, Victor Hugo, I mean, he ain't going to make it easy for you. Let me tell you that. Victor is from Episode 9 of Season 7. He last fought October 3rd. He got a Round 2 knee bar over Eduardo Torres Cotta. I actually remember that. 
eight KOs and nine subs of his 24 victories. He is on an insane 13 fight win streak. This one I'm really this one's gonna be really close. I won't lie. But Victor, Victor looked so good. When I saw him last, he's also got a cool mustache. I mean, that adds to some of the hype that I put behind him. But I just, I don't know. I don't know, guys. You know, Daniel Marcos, he's very talented. This is another one of those fights that makes me think, who should I pick? Who should I go with? But we have to decide. So let's kind of let's kinda weigh, let's weigh our options here on who we should predict to win. So obviously, Daniel Marcos is undefeated. But Victor Hugo is on a 13 fight win streak. So they've essentially almost won the same number of fights in a row. One's from Brazil, one's from Peru. I already predicted Vitor Petrino to lose. I don't know if two fighters who are undefeated are going to lose their O tonight. So I don't know. Victor has taken this on short notice, I believe. Hmm, I got to go with Victor Victor Hugo. Some's just telling me Victor Hugo is going to get it done. We're going to say by Unanimous decision. We're going to say by unanimous decision just because I just cannot see either man can finish. So, Victor Hugo over Daniel Marcos, but that's a toss up. That should be a very competitive fight. Keeping the prelims rolling, we head to welterweight where we have a ranked fighter. Number 15th ranked uh, welterweight contender Renat Fakredinov takes on Elizu Zaleski dos Santos. His nickname is Caporera. Man, oh man, wowza. Renat, he is 21 and 1. He's on a 17 fight win streak. He's from Moscow, Russia, an absolute animal of his 21 victories, 11 by knockout, 7 by sub. As for Elizio Zaleski dos Santos, 24 and 7. He is um, from Parna, Brazil, 14 KOs and 3 subs of his 24 victories. 6 foot to 5, 11 in favor of Renat, so just a eh, tiny, tiny uh, height advantage, not much. 74, 73 reach in favor of Renat, not too much. Both fighters fight orthodox. Renat, 32 years old. Zaleski dos Santos is 37 years old. Zaleski dos Santos, man, Capoeira, been in the UFC since 2016. There was at one point he was on a seven-fight win streak before Li Jingliang finished him in 2019. He's currently on a two-fight win streak with wins over Benoit Saint-Denis and Abu Bakar Nurmagomedov. That Benoit is very impressive. His last loss was to Muslim Salikov in 2020 by split decisions, a controversial one. Might I add, and I mean, some of his big wins, Omar Akhmedov, he beat in 2016, had a fight of the night against Max Griffin. He actually knocked out Sean Strickland, he became the first man to beat Sean Strickland in 2018 when he head kicked him in round one. Um, but other than that, I mean, the Benoit St. Denis one, super good, which was in October of 2021. Very much, uh, and Benoit St. Denis is on the come up tremendously. He's a very good fighter. This will be a tough test for Renat, but at the same time, 17 fight win streak. Renat's been a killer. His debut against Andres Macheldis, five takedowns for 13 minutes of control time. Absolutely insane. In rounds two and three, he had four and a half minutes of control time. And then on short notice, he fought Brian Battle. Actually, Brian Battle fought him, and Brian got absolutely destroyed. 43 to three in significant strikes, 102 to 25 in total strikes in favor of Renat. 14 minutes and 11 seconds in round one, four minutes, 41 seconds control time. Round two, four minutes, 49 seconds control time. Round three, four minutes, 41 seconds. Renat is a killer, and people were calling him boring. Okay, so in July of this year, he was facing Kevin Lee, and guess what? He finished Kevin Lee in 55 seconds. He knocked him down with the first punch he landed, strapped on a guillotine, and put him to sleep. Renat is a demon. He is a scary man, and honestly... I don't think anyone's going to be there to save Elizio Zaleski Dos Santos. We're going to go with Renat, but I do think Elizio's tough. So uh, we're going to say Renat by decision. But man, Renat, he's on the come up. With a win like this, he should um he should easily be moving up the rankings at uh, welterweight. I mean, he could be number 14 ranked Michael Chiesa, number 13 ranked Neil Magny, number 12 Kevin Holland. I mean, I could move him up to number 11 in the rankings. This guy is dangerous. That should be a super fun fight. Cannot wait to watch that one. Another good one to round out our prelims, a catchweight bout coming together last minute of sorts. Um, we have Elvis Brenner versus Kanan Bahia Krueschke. A uh, very uh, interesting one here. Kanan coming from this past season of Dana West Contender Series. He had a round one rear naked chokehold of Dylan Mantello. As for Elvis Brenner, two fights in the UFC, two victories. 
Let's get after it, man. This is going to be a good way to end the prelims. Elvis, 15 and 3. Kanan is 15 and 1. Uh, 510 to 6 foot in favor of Kanan and 73 to 72 inch reach in favor of Kanan as well. Both fighters fight Orthodox. Elvis, 26. Kanan, 32. What is he? 32 now. Wow. Elvis is from Sao Paulo, Brazil, so he's the hometown boy of his uh, 15 victories, 2 by knockout, 11 by sub. Currently on a 4-fight win streak, as I mentioned. 2-0 in the UFC. Big win over um, Zubara Tuigov by split decision. And then in July of this year, same card as that Renat finish of Kevin Lee, he upset Guram Kudalize with a round 3 knockout punch. It was a crazy upset. No one saw that coming. Cannot believe Guram Kudalaze is struggling right now, but Elvis Brenner is an absolute dog. Now, he is taking on Kaden Kureshki. He's from Bahia, Brazil, all right? Another Brazil native. Six-fight win streak of his 15 victories, four by knockout, nine by submission. We have two submission experts in this one. I'm very torn. I'm very torn in this one. I cannot lie. I saw how good Kanan is, but I also know how good Elvis Brenner is. Elvis does have in his corner Charles Oliveira. And if we analyze both of their last fights, so Kanan on the contender series took down Dylan Manitello. I mean, they were trading strikes for a bit, but just controlled him on the ground. So clearly he was good in that one. Now for Elvis Brenner, I mean, that Groom Kuladze fight took a lot out of him. They get brutally outstruck in round one, was relying on the takedowns. Round two, started getting back in the striking department. Guram was still beating them. Round three, was able to turn the tide in the striking department and finish Guram Kudaladze. I think simply because of status of who they beat, I got to go with Elvis Brenner. I got to go with Elvis Brenner. It might be a grappling bout. I can, I'm can. i not going to say by submission because I mean, both these guys are absolute dogs. But... I'll go with Elvis Brenner. And, you know, he's on a little four-fight win streak, six-fight win streak. This is excellent. This is expert matchmaking. This is why these people get paid to make fights. It should be a good one. It's Brazil versus Brazil. Someone has to go. And of the 14 Brazilian fighters, this is the only one where um, both fighters are from Brazil. So, I, be- I believe, didn't I? I think I did an analysis, and that wasn't the case. Yes, let me let me double-check here. Cal Fernandez was from Brazil, Eduardo Mora from Brazil, Denise Gomez, Vitor, Victor Hugo, Lizio Zaleski dos Santos, Elvis Brenner and Kanan were up to eight, Ishmael, Rodolfo Vieiro, Caio, Rodrigo, Gabriel Bonfim, and Halton made it perfect. So yes, this is our only Brazil versus Brazil fight. Should be very good. I wish both of these men the luck. And with that, with our prelims over, We will then get into our main card. But just to wrap up my prelim predictions, we're going to go with Cal Fernandez by uh, sub in round two. Eduardo Nora by uh, sub in round one. We're going to give Denise Gomez a unanimous decision. Modestus Bukakis was a huge upset round two KO over Vitor Petrino. Um, Victor Hugo with another upset of Daniel Marcos. Renat Fakredina by decision. And Elvis Brenner by uh, decision as well. This should be a super fun one. I can't lie. This is going to be a great, great card. Kicking off our main card, I mean, it is just, it's an amazing main card. I can't lie. We kick us off at lightweight with Ishmael Moretta Bonfim versus Vink from Hell Pachel. God, what a nickname there. Ishmael 19 and 4. Vic is 14 and 3. 5 8 to 5 10 in favor of Vink. And 72 to 71 inch reach in favor of Vink as well. Both fires fight Orthodox. Ishmael's 28. Vic is, wow. Vic is 41 years old. Vic is 41 years old. That's incredible. Wow. Vic is an old, old bugger. Ain't he? My goodness. And Vic's been in the UFC since 2012. I mean, he had a stint from 2012 to uh, 2014. Then he's had a stint since 2017. You know, not too many fights in the UFC, but he's been after it. Lost his UFC debut by slam to Rustam Rustam Kabliov. Then went on a four-fight win streak before losing to Gregor Giuseppe. Picked up wins over Jim Miller and Austin Hubbard, and last lost to Mark Madison in April of 2022. But he's back. But he has to take on this young up-and-coming killer from Brazil, Ishmael Bonfim. 19-4. and four. I mean, this guy is absolutely a menace. I cannot lie. He finishes almost all his fights. He won on Season 6 of Daniel's Contender Series. His UFC debut earlier this year, he lost by flying knee to Terrence McKinney, an insane knockout. 
in July, somewhat on that same card as Elvis Brenner and Renat Fakhradinov. Ishmael lost to Benoit Saint-Denis, but Benoit Saint-Denis is super good. He is super talented. And honestly, Vink is old. Vink is washed. We're going Ishmael Bonfim, round one sub. Lock it in on Verdict MMA. Follow me on the app. We're going with Ishmael Bonfim easily. I mean, this kid's younger. He is hungrier. And his only loss in the UFC is to a guy who's better than him, but still unranked. I mean, whew, that should be a really good one to kick off the main card. But yeah, Ishmael Bonfim. And his brother, Gabriel, we're going to get to him. He's in the co-main event. Two killers on the same card. You love it. Heading up to our next fight, we're at middleweight as Rodolfo Vieira, um, a uh, uh, Brazilian Brazilian fighter, takes on Armin P- Superman Petrosian. Armin, where is he from? He's from a European country, I believe. I cannot recall, actually. I should have wrote, wrote it down. But Rodolfo, 9-2. and two. Armin, 9-2 and two as well. 6-3 to 6 foot in favor of Armin. 73 to 71 reach in favor of Vieira. Both fighters fight orthodox. Rodolfo is 34. I believe he is. He's 34 years old. Armin is 33. Birthday's on November 2nd, actually, so 32 at the... Oh, no, his birthday's today. Happy birthday, Armin. Congratulations. Armin, Superman Petrosian, came on after Season 5 of Dan West's Contender Series, had a big knockout win. Beat Gregory Rodriguez his debut, which was impressive, then lost to Kyle Barallo. Since then, he's picked up two unanimous decision victories over A.J. Dobson and Christian Leroy Duncan. Christian won, came in June of 2023. So you know what? Good for him. He's a decision machine, though. I looked at his stats. Pretty much all his wins have been by decision of his nine victories. Almost all have been by decision. His opponent, Rodolfo, um, debuted in the UFC in 2019. He's gone 4-2 since then. Debuted with two straight arm triangles. Then got guillotine choked by Anthony Hernandez. Had a crazy performance of the night. Comeback against Dustin Stolfus. I still remember that fight from July of 2021. Then suffered a loss to Chris Curtis, but he was back in April of this year. Um, got an arm triangle win over Cody Brundage after losing round one. Both these guys are talented, but um, I got to give it to Armin Petrosian, the decision machine. He can fend off takedowns. I think he fends off Rodolfo Vieira, pieces him up on the feet, and gets another typical Armin Petrosian decision victory. Middleweight bout up next, with uh, which honestly, if I'm being honest, should be the co-main event. This fight is insane. The talent between these two. Kyo the Natural Baralo versus Abus Magomedov. I'm pumped for this one. Kyo, 14 and 1. Abus, 25, 5 and 1. Kyo is 5'10. Abus is 6'2. So we do have a 6 inch reach gap. I mean, height gap. Reach wise, Abus has 3 inches, 78 to 75. Southpaw stands for Kyo, Orthodox for Abus. Abus is 33 years old. Kyo is 30 years old. Abus. One and one in the UFC, he debuted in 2022, knocked out Dustin Stolfus in 19 seconds. But after fighting Sean Strickland in his first uh, UFC main event back in July, same card as that Renat, Elvis Brenner, I mean, Ishmael Bonfim, just that was a crazy card. Did lose in round two by TKO to the current middleweight champion, but he had a dominant round one, almost got Sean out of there, sadly gassed in round two. So if we're looking at Kyle Barallo, okay, for this fight, the main thing I'll tell you is on the feet, this can be won in round one by um, Abus Magomedov. But if it goes to round two, Kyle will submit him. I'm just going to say that, which is what I think is going to happen personally. I think Kyle's going to win this in round two. But if Abus catches him in round one, that's his prime opportunity. Kyle, I mean, he is just, he's 14 and one. He is 4 0 in the UFC now. Yes, he was 2 0 in the contender series. This guy's incredible, coming off a huge win over Michael Olka Jacek back in April. Got a performance bonus for his rear naked chokehold in round two. Kyo is so talented, could easily, easily be ranked in the top 15 at middleweight. Could easily take out probably the bottom five or six at middleweight. I, I love this guy, Kyle Barallo, in round two submission. One of my favorite fighters, and big wins over Mahmoud Muradov. Actually holds a win over Armin Petrosian, who fights before him. This is going to be a banger of a fight. If this one goes the distance, I I will be very, very surprised. Heading into our fourth fight. Wow, fourth fight in the main card. One of our two heavyweight bouts on the card is Rodrigo Nascimento takes on Dante Mays. By the way, Kyle Barallo is Brazilian. I was wrong, Madoff. Russian fights out of Germany. So another uh, Brazilian fighter there, Kyle Barallo. Rodrigo Zecolimia Nascimento, the... uh, 
Brazilian native takes on Dantel. Lord Kong Mays. Wow, Rodrigo is ten and one. Dantel is ten and five. Six foot six to six foot two in favor of Dantel. Wow, he's a big boy. Eighty one inch reach to eighty in favor of Dantel. Both fighters are orthodox, and both fighters are thirty one years old. Actually, Rodrigo's thirty. His uh, birthday is November twenty six, so almost thirty one. Rodrigo, man, the Brazilian native, has gone 3-1 with a no contest in the UFC. His only career loss is to Chris Dacus back in October of 2020. He won on Season 3 of the Contender Series, getting a Round 1 arm triangle win. Following that, he actually beat Dantel Mays in his UFC debut. Hit him with a rear naked chokehold in Round number 2. After that, he, of course, fought Chris Dacus, then had an overturned win over Alan Badeau, got performance bonus for it. Don't, or it was a no contest. I have no idea what happened in that fight. I can't even recall it. Um, but anyway, since then, beat Tanner Bozer in September of 2022. And earlier this year in May, beat ER Latifi. So a little two-fight win streak for uh, Rodrigo. As for Dontel Mays, been in the UFC since 2017. He was on the Contender Series three times, went 2-1 and one on it. It was able to get a contract. His UFC debut gets heel-hooked by Cyril God, got absolutely destroyed by him. Then actually, yep, as I mentioned, lost to Rodrigo Nascimentez. Went on a little two-fight win streak. Then had a no-contest loss to Hamdi Abuelwabab. Or actually, I think he won that fight. But since Hamdi tested positive for, like, drugs, he lost there or something. No idea what happened in that one. Then lost to Augusto Sakai. But recently, in June of this year, beat Andre Arlowski. Knocked him out cold in round number two. Look, this one's a toss-up, but Rodrigo already beat Dante. He submitted him in round two, so we'll spice it up and say that uh, Rodrigo submits him in round two. We'll go with Rodrigo over Dante Mays in the rematch. We're in Brazil. The crowd's going to be going crazy for him. And let's get into our co-main event because I cannot wait to see this fighter fight. Gabriel Maratina Bonfim, the absolute killer. He's an up-and-comer welterweight. He takes on Nicholas Danish Dynamite Dalby. That's right. We got Brazil versus the Danish in this one. Gabriel, a perfect 15-0. Oh, they might all be finishes. I'm pretty sure they are. Nicholas Dalby, 22-4-1 with two no contest. 6-1, 5-11 in favor of Bonfim. 74-inch reach to 72 in favor of Dalby. Both fighters fight orthodox. Gabriel's 26 Nicholas Dalby is, wow. Nicholas Dalby, ladies and gentlemen, 39 years old. If I'm doing my math correct, and I am. I am. He's actually 38 at the moment. My bad. Birthday's November 16th. Sorry, Dalby. Don't want to cut you short by a year. Dalby is on a little three-fight win streak. Been in the UFC since 2015. Actually picked up a win over prelims fighter Elizio Zaleski Dos Santos in his debut. Then fought Darren Till to a draw. Did suffer two losses after that, then picked up a win, no contest, another win, another loss. Since July 2022, 3-0, last win came over Muslim Salikov, beat him by decision. You know, he's yet to get a finish in the UFC, decision machine, but we'll see how he does here. As for Gable Bonfim, Season 6 of Dana White's Contender Series got a round one Von Flute choke. January of this year at UFC 283, 49-second guillotine choke of Manir Lezez. At UFC 291 in July of this year, a minute and 13 second guillotine choke of Trevin Giles. This guy is a killer, all right? He does not like to waste time, but you know what? On verdict, you know, his submission XP is too low. So we're going to go with Gabriel Bonfim by round one knockout. This guy's a killer. This would honestly be a bigger upset than Modestus Bukakis winning. Gabriel Bonfim, such a favorite in this one. He's got the Brazil crowd behind him. I'm riding with Bonfim in this one. Gabriel Bonfim over Nicholas Dalby. And honestly, I this should not be the co-main event, but if Bonfim gets him out of there quickly, it'll feel like a real co-main event. And just like that, ladies and gentlemen, we get into our main event. I'm so pumped. I can't wait to see this fighter fight as number 10 ranked Halton Almeida. Ooh, number 9 ranked Halton Almeida takes on number 10 Derek Lewis. I thought they were one spot lower. We got a little top 10 heavyweight action here. Halton Almeida was supposed to fight Curtis Blades, who's currently ranked number 5. Curtis had to pull out due to a knee injury, I believe. But you know what? Derek Lewis stepping in to save the day. And it turns out Derek Lewis, that uh, whole arrest thing, he says it was a case of wrong identity. It happened last week. I have no idea. He might even have court in December. But uh, nonetheless, he's in Brazil and the fight's going down. Halton Maldinio, Mal, Malhadino, Malhadino Almeida. He's got an interesting nickname. And of course, Derek the Black Beast. 14 knockouts, UFC record. He's incredible. But oh man, he's got a tough task ahead of him. Halton is 19 and 2. He's finished all 19 fights by finish. He is a killer. His average fight time is five minutes. And, oh, my gosh, we're going to get to some more of his stats in a second. 
Derek, 8 minutes and 30 seconds average fight time. Likes to get done too. Both fighters are 6'3 and have a 79-inch reach. Incredible. Both fighters fight orthodox. Halton is 31 year, 32 years old, I should say. Derek Lewis getting up there, man. Unfortunately, Derek is 38. It's been a good run, Derek, but oh my gosh, no. Derek Lewis is, yeah, Derek Lewis is 38. Derek Lewis been at it a long time. Holton though made a strikes absorbed per minute is 0. .3. Incredible. And takedowns average per minute, six. He averages six minutes. He averaged six takedowns every fight. 68% takedown accuracy. This guy's a killer. We'll talk about Derek Lewis first. Derek, been in the game a long time. We can go all the way back to 2014. He's knocked just about everyone out. Some of some of his biggest knockouts of all time. I mean, Shamil Abdurkhimov, Travis Brown, Marcy Tybura, Alexander Volkov, that Curtis Blades knockout, the Alexi Olenek, the Chris Dacus. His last win came from came over Marcus Rogero de Lima back in July. Knocked him out with a big knee, then some follow-up punches in 33 seconds. Marco's currently ranked number 14 at heavyweight, by the way. For that, though, he had been on a little three-fight losing streak. He is two and four, you know, in his last six fights. But Derek, he's fought so many tough guys. Sergey Spivak, Sergey Pavlovich, Tai Tuivasa, Sirokan. He only fights killers. I mean, this guy's an animal. Fought for the heavyweight championship against Daniel Cormier in 2018. He holds a win over Francis Ngannou. I mean, Derek Lewis, iconic. 14 knockouts to his name. If he catches Halton here, that would be legendary. But that's no easy task. As Halton Almeida, 5-0 in the UFC, coming from Season 5 of Nanoite's Contender Series. The farthest he's been is 2 minutes and 56 seconds into round number 2. This guy finishes fights. His last win over Jarzinho Rosenstruck submitted him with a rear naked chokehold. Got performance bonus for it in 3 minutes and 43 seconds. And by the way, through his first 5 UFC fights, he has absorbed 2 significant strikes. I mean, in his UFC debut against Daniello Marquez, 2 for 2 on takedowns. Didn't absorb a single strike in the fight. Got him out of there in 2 minutes and 57 seconds. Against Parker Porter... Absorbed no strikes, got him out of there in 4 minutes and 35 seconds. Anton Turgolic was able to land 19 total strikes, only one was significant, before getting submitted in round 1. And Shmuel Durkimov landed 3, 3 total strikes, one was significant in his round 2 TKO loss. Oh man, and by the way, if you couldn't have guessed, Jarzinho Rosestruck, no significant strikes, 3 total strikes. This guy has been incredible. Holt Almeida has just been on the run of a lifetime. I don't think it stops here, guys. Round 1 submission... Look, I I mean, obviously Derek Lewis can catch him, but we look to Sergey Spivak. Sergey Spivak's wrestling, I don't think, is anywhere near as Halton Almeida, and he got brutally taken down by Sergey Spivak. Um, Derek Lewis did. So we'll go with Halton Almeida by round one submission. But man, this anything could happen, but I really think Halton Almeida is the next big guy at heavyweight. I mean, looking looking up, he beats Taito Ivasa. He beats Sergey Spivak. He beats Volkov. He beats Blades. It's that Aspinall, Pavlovich, Gon, and John Jones. Those are the top guys at the moment. Stipe Miokic, honestly, I don't even know how he's in the rankings right now. Curtis Blades is hit or miss. Actually, Volkov has been on the come up. I should not discredit him at all. He's been an absolute killer. But Holton made a man. This is his time to shine. It's supposed to be against Curtis Blades. But nonetheless, he will fight Derek the Black Beast. Lewis. So let's recap our main card predictions for you real quick. Ishmael Bonfim over Vink from Hell, Pachel, by round one submission. Um, Armin Petrosian over Rodolfo Vieira by unanimous decision. Kyle Barallo over Abus Magomedov in round two, round two submission. Rodrigo Nascimento over Dantel Mays by round two knockout. Gabriel Bonfim over Nicholas Dalby by round one knockout. And Halt Almeida over Derek Lewis by round one submission. I expect a lot of finishes on this Brazilian card. We haven't been to Brazil since January. So happy to be back. And this is just going to be a blast of a card. And I cannot wait to watch it this Saturday on ESPN. Plus, and I just want to give one shout out before the episode is over to Hoist. You know, I'm always here if you guys want to sponsor me. I enjoy having your IV hydration drinks. You support the military. I love you guys so much. I'm starting to dabble into some other flavors. I was trying the orange, trying the uh, red or whatever. So if you guys want to reach out to me, I'll continue to tag you in my posts. And you know what? I could do it for free. You know, I could just be a brand ambassador if you guys promote the podcast yourself. Just had to get that plug in there as well. About to go watch that um, Titans and Steelers game coming up. Actually, I cooked dinner too. Maybe have a couple of Mike's Hearts lemonades. They, they could sponsor me too. Guys, 
Thank you so much for listening. It's another fun episode. Talk about Invincible, talk about Week 9, the NFL, all sorts of sports stuff going on, world stuff going on. I mean, I like to say world events. I should probably change that because I'm not going to get into politics on the podcast. So I should, probably should edit that. But uh, in the meantime, enjoy the weekend. Enjoy the fights. Enjoy any games you watch. Just be blessed. Be safe. And I hope you were surprised and you were jabbed nice and hard. That's a weird way to end it. So just have a good day.